Good evening runners and welcome back to another video from Me That Running Girl. In today's video I'm going to be talking about my experience running my 31st marathon which I ran a week and a half ago now and I just wanted to do a quick recap on how the race went, what went well, what didn't work so well and what I've learned from the event and what I want to take into marathon running beyond this. So first of all, I'd like to say a huge thanks to Abingdon Marathon. I have been running this race since 2009 when I was literally on my second or third marathon and the entire time you were not allowed to wear headphones. It was just an absolute no um, in terms of if you asked them if you wanted to wear headphones, they would always say no. The people in charge and the race directors were really, really strict on it. And like most races in the UK up until now, bone conduction headphones weren't even a thing. And they were just, they went on the grounds of safety and were very much against it. So up until this year, I have run the Abingdon Marathon since 2009 without any headphones, which has been tough, but doable. I have obviously run a lot of marathons without headphones. But for me personally, I do, do find it a lot easier running with headphones. So thank you to Abingdon Marathon. They have a number of new race directors um, who have made the race way more inclusive for neurodivergent people and for women um, and for people that don't run marathons in an insanely fast time. Um, not only did they allow bone conduction headphones at the event this year and in years to come, they have also um, made a lot of other really good changes in terms of, uh, you know, um, they have an area at the start now where it's really quiet so you can go and just get away from the hustle and bustle of the race if you need to just relax and have that quiet time before the race. And they've also got more portaloo stops. I think there was like a portaloo every 5k um, on the race, which is obviously really handy if you need that. Um, if anything goes wrong, you know, if you eat or drink something that doesn't agree with your stomach, it's just so handy to have that um, and know you've only got three miles to the next portaloo station. Um, and yeah, they've they've increased the cutoff time. I think the cutoff time originally was maybe five hours and the cutoff time now is six hours with a 15 minute grace period. So again, if anyone's training for the marathon and it's definitely, you know, it's their first marathon, they think they're not going to make it through. They've made it a lot more inclusive and um, empowering for people to actually be able to run marathons. So I am 100% on board with that. So that's the first thing that I wanted to say. That's the first thing that went well about the marathon. And I definitely felt like going into the marathon this time, having that quiet area at the start as someone who just gets creeped out by so much, you know, hype and noise and crowds. And I manage that the best I can in terms of choosing races with lower numbers of people. So a marathon in general, Abingdon Marathon has like 900, 1000 runner maximum, but you know, marathons like London Marathon has 45,000 runners and other big marathons has, you know, tens of thousands of runners. So for me personally, I do manage that really well by doing that, but it's really nice that um, a big marathon or marathon that was you know quite big in my life um Oxfordshire's only marathon has been able to um accommodate that in terms of giving people that quiet space at the beginning so it was really good to go in that quiet space and just you know get to the race in good time set out everything I needed for the race you know got everything in my belt everything ready to go and then just have that time to just chill out and not have any stress before the race which was really really nice Second thing that went really well in the marathon was accepting that I had absolutely no time pressures for this marathon. So this year, without going into too much detail, has been insanely turbulent for me. I moved house in March this year with my partner. So obviously huge amount of change, environmental change there. Um, then my partner also changed jobs about three or four months later. Again, a lot of change in terms of both the dynamics of things, but also um, our time we went to bed shifted, became a lot earlier, you know, time that I would be doing things in the evening shifted, the whole, you know, routine, and then your running obviously fits into that. And that was a big change and something that, you know, was 
not expected so yeah also there's been other sort of changes in my life in terms of like family dynamics and there's just been a lot to get my head around this year um so also I went on four holidays this year which I'm insanely grateful for but also has meant that I didn't have the same consistency and routine in training um not that I would have you know changed anything about it but it just meant that I had these insanely beautiful and lovely experiences but you don't want to do a 15 mile training run in Mexico you just you just don't want to do it so um the only long run I had building up to the marathon was a 15 mile run that I actually ran the week before the marathon um and I just didn't needed that to give me the confidence boost that I was still able to get that kind of distance in and I was still able to do it so I literally ran my 31st marathon with my only long run as a 15 mile run but I also did uh, Woodstock 12, which is a very hilly 12 mile course um, leading up to that marathon, which also gave me a bit of confidence because I actually find that race harder than I do a 15 mile training run on the flat. So just accepting a get round for me because I had a really turbulent year and a not ideal kind of preparation for the marathon. Um, I'm not one of these people these days that has, you know, 100% commitment to time to training for a marathon and training at this pace and doing this session and doing this at this point I just don't have um, the means to do that anymore so running a business as well um, you know um, means that sometimes my schedule can be quite um, chaotic so just accepting I was just going to get round and just whatever it took to get to the finish line just helped me with the mindset of thinking it doesn't matter what pace I run so you know I wasn't constantly like looking at my watch the whole time I literally just had the ambition to get round and I ran up to maybe 16 17 miles before I started kind of walk jogging which I was really pleased with given my fast track up to the marathon and the fact that I didn't you know um have like a really precise or a really ideal kind of preparation for it which I was really pleased about um, another thing that I was really pleased about in the race was how I fueled. So on the 15 mile run that I did the week before the marathon, I tried out some new fueling. Um, as you know, if you watch this channel, I do better with real foods and real drinks than isotonic or gels. Um, they've just never been able to settle in my stomach when I'm running. And um, I actually did really well eating um, vegetarian corn cocktail sausages, um, which gave me a bit of a boost. Uh, so I basically used them and just regular sweets, regular Coke. And I also tried out a new gel, which was Protein Rebels maple syrup that I got on really well with, um, which is entirely vegan and literally just has two ingredients which are maple syrup and um, Himalayan salt so I got on really well with those as well um, I didn't take many of them I literally took like maybe one and a half of them but got on really well with those um, another thing I implemented for this marathon was having a shorter stride so my running style in general I have a relatively long stride it's just the way that my hips kind of land and fall as I run um, and I have a relatively good knee lift if I haven't run 20 or 22 miles yet. So in the first kind of stages of the marathon, I definitely attempted to shorten my stride. So I had, you know, I, I conserved energy more. Um, and that's something I also practiced on the 15 mile um, run. And I found it so much easier. I literally felt like if I had to do an ultra and I wanted to run 30 or 35 miles I could have done it by shortening my stride and I was actually quite uh, blown away by how much energy I felt like I conserved by doing that um, and it's definitely something I'd like to look into uh, if I get a more advanced Garmin next year um, because I know some of those tell you more about your stride length and um, definitely something I'd like to look into, but, and the, you know, how to get a higher cadence because my cadence is relatively good, but I feel like with the shorter stride, it is obviously going to increase. Um, so yeah, that would be really interesting. Um, so there are the things that went well in the race. The things that didn't go well in the race, um, first of all was, my hair now you might think oh that's such a you know 
minor thing to be moaning about in a marathon. But I'm not talking about the way my hair looked. I'm talking about the amount of hair that I almost lost after the marathon. So basically, the marathon being the marathon was uh, quite overcast and rainy and wet for the sort of four or five hour block that the marathon was on. And then the sun came out and it was really nice weather. And every other day of the week in Abingdon was really nice weather. And all of the days leading up to it were really nice weather. But that four or five mile block um, in the marathon was really overcast, really wet, rather humid as well. Um, so as you can imagine, with long hair, that just ends up into a crazy tangled knot. So after the marathon, I tried brushing my hair out and it took my partner and I half an hour with hair oil, conditioner, trying to wash it. Um, my partner literally used a, a like a kebab skewer <laughs> and a hairbrush in the end and took half an hour untangling the insane matted knots in my hair. Um, yeah, we were worried that I was going to have to lose a third of my hair and cut it out. So that's something that was quite traumatic <laughs> in the race. But again, something that you learn from. I definitely won't be having a ponytail uh, if it's at all wet in a race up to marathon distance anymore. Um, I think I will probably go for this Dutch braid uh, that I've literally only just about learned to master at the moment. I might do a video on it, actually. Um, but yeah, that's something I'm not looking forward to ever repeating in a marathon. Um, another thing that didn't go well is, I guess, the weather. Um, I know you can't ever control the weather, but yeah, I felt like the weather, it was a tricky one because it wasn't um, that cold. It was quite warm for the UK um, at the end of October. I think it was around 17 degrees. And so it was really one of those tricky ones when you didn't know how many layers to wear I did basically I didn't know whether to wear a sports bra or to wear a vest um because I, I overheat quite easily in races not so much in training it's weird I can wear like four or five layers when I'm out running and training and feel fine but if I'm in a race I just don't like to be hot, too hot at all so I ended up running in sports bra but it was one of those ones where you kind of think you're out for so long that you don't want to get too cold but then if you wear too many layers in a race, you then have to, you know, carry it with you or leave it with someone if you're, you know, have supporters at certain points. So that was kind of difficult too. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the only thing that went badly in the marathon, other than maybe, you know, in other people's perception, not running the best time. My time was like 4.34 on my watch and 438 on the clock because I found the route to be uh, long. It was like 26.4 or something on my watch. So I literally stopped my watch when I got to 26.2, um, which is 20 minutes slower than the first marathon that I've ever run uh, about 17 years ago. So if you put that into context, my PB is 317. And there was a number of times in my 20s when I'd constantly run like 320, 325. 3.30, you know, 3.27, 3.32. Um, and I'd be constantly banging out, you know, 3.20, sub 3.30 marathons. And it's one of those things where these days I just don't care what other people think about my running times. Um, I feel like we're all on running our own races and we're all on a different um, journey and path with our running and in life. And like I said earlier on in the video, um, my life has been far from straightforward this year. So for me to even just be turning up on the start line and then getting to the finish line of a marathon, which, you know, to me is a really big triumph for going through so much change in the year. I could have just been like, mm, I haven't had the time to train for it. I'm not going to do it. Whereas I personally like to give myself these marathon challenges. I almost, when I started doing them, would think of spring and autumn marathons almost like a kind of running and health MOT to see how I'm doing and how I'm feeling and I just felt incredible in this marathon. I'd been taking my iron um, supplements religiously up to the, iron, up to the marathon. 
I've been getting more sleep, which is mainly because my partner has to go to bed earlier because his uh, job is further away now. So I've been getting more sleep. I've been taking more iron. Um, I had the relaxed chill out area at the start of the marathon that really helped. I had music that really helped. And I literally just enjoyed the whole thing. I didn't put any pressure on myself. And yeah, it was just one of those marathons that I just got round and just kept reminding myself I have run 30, this is my 31st marathon. And that was quite a nice, cool feeling because I don't think many people have done that. But yeah, looking to um, the future of marathon running, I'm definitely up for doing more. I thought I thought there would be a point where I'd sort of get to and think, you know, maybe I'll call it a day at 20 marathons or maybe I'll leave it on a round number and call it a day at, you know, 25 marathons. But there's just something that keeps drawing me back to the challenge of the marathon, um, just the endurance and the resilience of character um just really appeals to me and I definitely think that I want to um I never thought about this I thought about this maybe thought about doing an ultra maybe after my like third marathon when I was really you know hooked on it and new to it and I hadn't thought about it since um but I would really like to run Race to the Stones one day. Um, so whether that's next year or the year after, I definitely have my sights set on that. So watch this space for that. And um, yeah, I run my 31st marathon and um, that's how it went. <laughs> so let me know in the comments below um, whether you've run the Abingdon Marathon before or how many marathons you've run. And um, yeah, I'll be doing um, a video on some reviews coming up and uh oh yeah the last thing that i wanted to say about this is this this is the second year that i've run a marathon in the nike invincibles and i train and race in those and i absolutely love them um i don't think i've done a review video on the nike invincible 3 so watch the space for that and i will do that shortly and um just found that they had like loads of cushioning the right amount of stability but also they have a bounce to them that you don't even get with carbon plate running shoes because i have carbon plate running shoes and i feel there's more bounce in the nike invincible even though they don't have a carbon plate in them so watch this space for my review on them and i hope you're running well and i'll see you in my next video